his schedule and his timetable. Remember Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you my disciples, I call you my friends. And intimacy. So he was able to tell them he will go to the cross, die, and then he will resurrect again. He talked to them as friends. Can you imagine God wanting to befriend you? God wanting to befriend me? You see, sometimes we have preached a God who's way out there. Who's saying, I'm holy and you better smarten up because I'm coming to get you. There was a great message preached and a lot of people were converted. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. But we should never forget... He's a merciful God. Yes. Yes. And we come as sinners and only He has the power to change us and make us saints. Mm -hmm. And many times we forget that God is in the process of changing us inside out. So you see, everything that we are given of that is going to be future is to prepare us to show us who has the final yes and no. And I'm sorry, folks. It's not Trudeau. It's not Biden. It's not Blake Hicks. <coughs> and it's not your pastor. God is the final one who will say yes and who will say no. So guess what? When you want the most authoritative word, guess where you'll have to go? You'll have to go to him. Because he's got the yes even over your life and no over your life. So here we come, the power of God's wrath unleashed. This is a hard chapter. Yes. So we, you see the first, remember there will be three sets of wrath that has been unleashed. And at each moment, God is still crying out, come unto me, come unto me. He says, don't take the mark of the beast. Because then you have sold yourself to him, and to him you will belong. And as I will punish Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, you will be part of that punishment. So God gives us the warning. You know, for us who have been parents, remember how we used to tell our, our children, you do not go across the line. Don't go there. Don't do this. Is it because we hated our children? Doesn't the Bible say whom he loves, he disciplines? <clears throat> you know what a child told me one time? When my parents discipline me, it's then I know they love me. Wow! Talk of uh, the wisdom of Solomon, their child had it. So the first angel poured uh, his bowl what happened to mankind? Harmful and painful sores on the whole earth. Verses 1 and 2. No going to go back to that. I'm just going to touch this point to bring us to where we are now. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea and it became like blood. And remember, why did God turn water into blood? He says, every living thing died in the sea because they had shed the blood of the saints. I tell you, if you want to learn about fatherhood and motherhood, come to God's word and see how possessive he is of his children. And in his possessiveness, he does not only just sit back and let the child do whatever they want. He disciplines us to turn us to be the people that we should be. Thirdly, the third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and into the streams and they became blood. Boy, all those nice trout. Why is God bringing such devastation to planet Earth? Because man has established himself as God and they will do what they want and they're trying to shut God out from the very world he created. 
the fourth angel's pronouncement. It's very interesting, verses 5 and 7. I will touch this. The angel will pronounce after the third uh, bowl is poured out. And in Revelation 16, verse 5 says, And I heard an angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought this judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserved. And I heard the altar say, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Why is the altar mentioned here? Because who is standing under the altar? The saints who were butchered. There's a day of revenge. It's not the day of your revenge. Because you don't like the pastor. There's going to be a day of revenge. What does the Bible say? Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. There's a day God will take revenge. So don't dirty your hands. Trying to take revenge. Christians trust in the Lord. Mm. He has set a time for that. The fourth angel bow, uh, bowls poured on the sun. Can you imagine? Now here I want to make a contrast so you understand. Satan can only affect the things that's on earth when he's kicked on planet earth. He can manipulate and play with things around on earth. But guess who is the God of the universe? Guess who has the control over the sun, the moon, the stars? Not Satan. God does. The hymn, All Hail, the Power of Jesus' Name. Can somebody remember the rest of those the words? An angel, and then what does it the say? The angels prostrate. Yes, an angels prostrate fallen then. Bring forth the royal diadem. Bring forth the royal diadem and do what? Crown him. Christian, do you know your first responsibility is to crown Jesus Christ as Lord and King? I don't care what somebody does in the church, how long they've done it in the church. If you have not crowned Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you have no right to serve Him. And can I tell you, it's not one day performance, it's every day. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so here we see the fourth angel bowl, bowl, uh, the ball on the sun and what happened to the people they are scorched so what does that tell you the sun is under the power of the son of God the king of kings and he can tell the sun where to go how far to go only he can set the parameters around the sun no man no entity can so like I said, when we come to the God of the Bible, he's not one of us. We build a little statue and worship him. And do you see what happens to us Christians? When troubles come, we put our tail in between and we run with the trouble instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to stand in time of trouble? And it's amazing sometimes you see how we start to run all over the place when we should be standing firm on the truth of God's word. And what did they do when these people, verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 8, the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire, and they were scorched by fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. Do not repent. They did not repent and give him glory. Even at that moment, God gave them an opportunity to see who has all the power and glory and yet they would not turn and repent. You see, this is an unexplained catastrophe in the sun, verses 8 and 9. Now remember, while God is sending his judgment on earth, Satan has tried to build his kingdom, tried to take over Jerusalem and the new temple and declare himself as God. Because you remember in Revelation 13, 13, it says the, the, the false prophet that's going to come, he performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. How many of you have seen, you've gone to some of these shows and this person is breathing fire? <laughs> wow. I'm looking at those guys and said, have you never barbecued? 
<laughs> but what's the trick? They have this liquid. And they like find they spew it out and the fire comes out and we wow, what a miracle. <laughs> Let me tell you folks, Satan has got a lot of tricks up his sleeves. How do you counter the tricks of the enemy? By knowing the truth. That's why the Bible says the truth will do what? Set you free. Set you free. Free from what? Don't go into the uh, in, into the world and uh, accumulate great debt and say, now God, you're going to set me free from this debt. That's not what he's talking about. He will set you free from the trickery and power of the enemy. Isn't it amazing in Luke 21, 25, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Verse 26, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of heaven will be shaken. You know what's coming because God had said it. That's why the Bible is not given to us as one of the books collecting dust on the shelf. It's given to you for you to know the truth. And then when you know the truth, guess what your responsibility is? To be prepared. <laughs> the fifth angel's bowl is poured out on the throne of the beast. Imagine, if you can just get the big guy, Guess what will happen to the disciples? They will scatter in all the places. Did Jesus say, strike the shepherd and what will happen to the sheep? They'll be scattered. So God does not only bring judgment on earth to show people that Satan has got no power. His judgments are going to come through because of what the enemy has done. And then the fifth angel, Paul, is poured on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom is plunged into darkness. People will know their tongues. Verses 10 and 11. Here we are told the judgment is completed. God's rescue of the world proceeds in three stages. The domains of the beast are ravished. Verses 10 and 11. The directives of the battle are released. Verses 12 to 16. And the destruction of Babylon is realized. So we look at verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People know their tongues in anguish. And cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Again and again. When the Bible says they did not repent of their deeds. They were given an opportunity. God never sends judgment without giving us the opportunity to come to Him. But what do we do? You see, the world is so much interested in little religion. It's like buying your ticket in case there is a God, in case things go bad, we can take the ticket and say, God, I've got my ticket. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And sometimes the churches, we are so happy to get people find the little ticket for heaven because then they will just keep coming and they'll be happy with that little ticket because it's a little security. I'm sorry to say to you, if you're looking for security in a church, you don't have any. You know how good insurance are? Pay for this, pay for that, pay for this, pay for that. And the day when you really need for them to come through, they come with all kinds of stipulation, don't they? Don't use God as an insurance company people. Because he doesn't call you to look to him as an insurance company. He calls you that you may be his and he will be yours. Here we come and we see the domains of uh, the beast are ravished. And it's amazing. They will curse God because there is such darkness. Now, I've been in dark places. I never know on my tongue. But I'll tell you what. There is a darkness that will come when you'll cause such pain 
Now, I've bitten my tongue a number of times. Because if I didn't eat fast, Gil might get more. So I try to eat fast and bite my tongue. It's very painful. Try gnawing on your tongue. But that's what's coming, people. So here we see, I love the little book of Joel. Joel talks about the day of the Lord. <laughs> love that book. That book uh, took a man who thought he was very ordinary in the church of Jesus Christ. And through that book, God opened his mind in such a way. And my goodness, I could not teach the class like he taught. God's word. The truth will set you free. In Joel chapter 2 verse 1 it says, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming and it is near. And then Joel chapter 2 verse 2 says, A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness they spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people, like their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generation. See, Joel, Joel also gave the prophetic prediction of what Revelation is going to say. Here it is. Can't take one chapter of the Bible and pull it out. I keep on telling you, and please let me remind you again, the Bible is a chain. You cannot take one link out of the chain. Genesis refers to Revelation. Revelation refers to Genesis. And it's just amazing. Jude 1.13. Jude writes, Wild waves of the sea, casting up form of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Jude also gives us the prophetic pronouncement. You see, that's why I... Tell myself, and I want to tell God's people in a very kind way, don't use God as a tour guide to lead you to heaven. God is not in the tourist business, people. God is in the business of receiving you as his own. And there's a process to be his own. Sometimes I hear some of the preaching that is taking place, and it's almost like use God as a tour guide. You see, the beast is powerless against the God of heaven, for he cannot help those he perverted and those who chose to take his mark. Did you know that? Be careful who you associate with. The sixth angel bowl is poured out on the river Euphrates. What happens to that great river? Do you know right now, <coughs> river Euphrates is one of the main resources for water in that dry and thirsty land. Imagine when it dries up, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Do you know that river Euphrates, Tigris and Euphrates were considered gods? Now the God who created that river is going to take charge. He's going to drive up that, that, uh, that place up. Why? Because the armies of the world are going to gather to fight against God. Sometimes stupidity can linger so long and go so deep. When will we understand? That's why God has given us the future picture so that you and I will prepare today. Remember when Lee was coming through? Boy, that's the time we were going to have Christian Rivers come over here. But, you know, I pulled my generator out. I had one working, small one, so I said, that'll be fine. My wife said, you want to get the generator ready? I said, well, I, well you know, just that procrastination attitude. You pay a big price. But guess what? We came through. We missed a big piece of wood that would have fallen on the camper or on the car. It destroyed the cleanliness of my yard. How can you prepare for something like that? Tell me. God has given us everything for you and I to be prepared today. That if he shows up the next hour, 
you're ready to go home. You're ready to be with him forever. That's why the Bible gives us this warning ahead of time. So then, what do we see? As the angel dries up, the bowl is poured out, the, the river is dried up. Verse 12, the angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water dried up to prepare, to prepare for the way for the kings from the east. East of what, people? East of Jerusalem. See, the target has always been God's chosen people. God is so good. He's going to deal with his people, the children of Israel. But he has already brought his bride next to him. You see, the directions of the battle are released. You see, Armageddon is going to be the final war of the age. The Holy Land has been chosen by God as a stage upon which two crucial events will take place. One on a mountain and one on a plain. People, hear this out. Mount Calvary and the plain of Megiddo are two altars of sacrifice that dominate the history of the world. Did you ever know that? The plain of Megiddo where River Euphrates is going to be, is going to be dried up. But there was also the place called Mount Calvary, isn't it? So let's put our mind in gear and understand something really important. You know, we are all interested. What's going to happen tomorrow? What is God saying? What is it? God has already told us what he's doing. Now listen to this. Mount Calvary and the plain of Megiddo are two altars of sacrifice that dominate the history of the world. On Mount Calvary, grace redeemed the world by the sacrifice of God's Son. On the plains of Megiddo, vengeance offers the army of the world a sacrifice of doom. You see, it's not finished yet. When Jesus said, cried out on the cross, it is finished. You know what he meant by it is finished? He had paid the ultimate price for sin and now men could come and get saved. But then there's a day of vengeance. It's not your vengeance, my man. It is God's vengeance on the world that refused and rejected his son. When Jesus said, I am the door, no one comes to the Father but through me. Today we are trying to be nice to people and saying, yeah, you know, you, you can believe what you believe, but you know, just as long as you believe on God. No, there's only one way. At least this church has got two doors, you know, the back and the side here. But if you try to get through the window, I'd call you a thief. And knowing how reactionary I am, I might take one of the big books and hit you on the head and put you out. But there's only one way. And that way has been prepared through the cross. Because sin had to be made it out. And now God is going to deal with all that is. So it's very interesting to see that on Mount Calvary, grace redeemed the world by the sacrifice of God's Son. And on the plains of Megiddo, vengeance offers the armies of the world a sacrifice of doom. Both are bloodbaths. Both are descent of the wrath upon sin. His death on the cross was God's wrath on sin. He meted out on his only son. And in the plains of Megiddo, the battle of Armageddon will be God's wrath on the unbelieving, sinful world that has turned his face away from him. And they are both brought about by God's bitterest foes who work out, despite themselves, God's perfect and sovereign will. Across both can be written the words of Peter. Listen to what Peter will say in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Here Paul or Peter recognized what had happened to Jesus Christ coming. And even though man had gathered against him, he had come to bring redemption. You see, from each proceed a supper. One is a feast of remembrance for the people of God. Remember every time we take uh, the communion? 
It's a feast of remembrance. Christ going on the cross for your sin, for my sin. It's a feast of remembrance. The other feast that's going to take in Armageddon is going to be a feast of retribution for the carrier. At Calvary, they're hung up to the gates of heaven, a victorious cry, it is finished. And at Armageddon, they rings down to earth, an answering cry from the temple and the gates of glory, it is done. And folks, as God's people, I rejoice for the fact that I want to be on His side. And when He cries out, it is done, my redemption is complete and I'm going to be with Him forever. What about you? God is not in the business of a tour guide. God is not in the business of insurance. He says, come unto me all you labor and heavy laden. So you see, chapter 16 pushes me to run back into the arms of God, my Savior. And that's where I want to stay until the calling comes and I'm out of this place. So I will be in this beautiful place. But you know, one day the beauty of this place is going to be completely reversed. But I want to be facing the beauty in heaven. You see, the great deception through the great demonic spirit and the great battle of Armageddon, verses 13 to 16. I want to finish this message. Revelation chapter uh, 16, verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they're demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the God Almighty. Verse 15. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assemble them at a place in Hebrew called Armageddon. See, the word has already given us the next chapter. Forget about Newsweek. Forget about the Moncton Telegraph or whatever else you read. God has given us what's coming. Why? So that you and I may be prepared. When he calls us, we are ready to go home. Somebody asked me, should I go home and pack a suitcase? I said, if you think you need it, then you don't know the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the seventh angel of all is poor God's <coughs> judgment on the satanic trinity and rebellious mankind. This is the sad part, but the destruction of Babylon is realized. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and great earthquake as such as there has never been since man was on the earth. <coughs> so great was that earthquake. Satan can shake the earth, but God can shake the whole world, including the universe. The great city was split in three parts, and the cities of nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. Thank God I'm allergic to pain. But there's a pain that will come on the whole world. A pain that I don't even like to think about, but it's going to be there. And all he does for me to say, be ready. When he calls, I'm ready. The question is, folks, how ready you want to be? You'll only be ready according to the word that will prepare you to be ready. Father, we thank you for your grace. We are creatures of time and Lord, our mind can only take so much. You are a God of mercy and a God of love, and we see it. You show mercy where mercy is not even, when we think we don't even need it, you show mercy and you show grace and you show love. 
He said, come unto me all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And Father, how different is your rest from the world that's around us. But Father, even in your church, there are those of us who are restless because we have not come fully to accept that you are God and you alone have our future detailed out. Would you give us the grace and open our eyes and our ears and our heart that when we say Jesus is Lord, it comes from the very center of our being. It's not words that is spoken to sound good, but it is truth that is lived out. Jesus is Lord. This is the day you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God, you are on the move. Help us as your people to be on the move with you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>